Maybe your wife will not listen to you, even though she knows what you tell her is true. Even though she would agree the recommendations that you would make to her would be beneficial for her, yet maybe she just refuses to listen. Maybe you have children who would like to bring them up in the way in which they should go. And you offer recommendations and suggestions for obedience and they don't much pay any mind to what you would have to say. Maybe you've got relatives, family whom you love dearly or very close friends who you love that ask your opinion and you give it to them, but they don't heed it. Maybe you've got a dog that continuously barks and you cannot quiet him. We live in a fallen world. Now, the conception of religion, especially Christianity, would have you to believe that you were made in the image of God. Now, the original prototype Adam was made in the image of God, the image and the likeness of and the character of, of God. And Genesis chapter 5 verse 3 clearly tells us that Adam had a son named Seth. Seth was made in the likeness and the image of Adam who was a fallen man. So what's the common denominator between those that you would like to help? Not that you're some great intellect or, you know, you're some guru or, you know, you're some kind of a psychologist. You know, I'm, I'm talking about just the reality of things, that if we exercise, we would lose weight. It would be beneficial for us. These things are common sense. You know, that's sense is not so common anymore. Good sense, that is. Seems bad sense is predominant. But, like I said, not that you're any type of a great intellect, or, or I, perhaps I'm not, um, or anything of that nature, just the reality of what's true. Why will people not listen? Why do they not care what you have to say? Why will they not value your opinions which are true. Well, it's simple. It's, the world is eat up with pride. It's all about self. It's about their own achievement. It's about what they want, what they want to do. And we see exactly where this comes from. Genesis chapter 3 now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field that the Lord God had created. And he came up to the woman and he said, Hath God really said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said, Oh, we shall eat of the trees of the garden, but not the tree that's in the midst of the garden. For the Lord God had said, You shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it. Now, I've read through that multiple times. I never read where God said, don't touch it. Now, these commandments were given to Adam. At one time, Adam was in perfect union and harmony. He would be holy with God. For holy means to be separate. God is separate from man because man is a sinner. But Adam, at one point, found favor in the sight of God. God's creation, Adam means red earth, made him from the dirt. Eve was made from Adam. And so the Lord God in the cold of the day would come down and, and actually spend time with Adam. Now this is a pre-incarnate Christ being the bodily, bodily enfleshment of God would come down for God is spirit. But Christ is, was, at that time, a man. Before his incarnation, he would still appear in the scriptures as a man. 
So what, what happened? What was so wrong with what Eve did? Well, it's disobedience. She did not obey God. And essentially, I don't, I don't suppose it would really matter what the disobedience was. It carries the same penalty, regardless if it's not in eating of the fruit, or it is the eating of the fruit that is disobedience, uh, to tell a lie, to cheat, to steal. And we say, well, everybody cheats. You know, everybody has stolen something at least once. And this is true. But this is God's position. Do you like it when someone would steal from you? Do you like to be lied to? Well, imagine God. He's far beyond our comprehension and understanding. He's on a completely different level of perfection. And we're not. We're fallen. And we are fallen not only by our own sins, but by the imputation of the sins we've inherited through the bloodline of Adam. There's none exempt. The only one that was exempt was Jesus Christ. And he missed Adam's contribution for God himself was the Father. The Holy Spirit was the one that impregnated Mary. Now, we're not talking about intercourse here. We're talking about a spiritual thing. You know, the virgin would conceive a child. Emmanuel would be his name. God with us. And that's what it was for Adam. God was with him. God was with them in the garden. Now, many think that Adam was far and away somewhere. He was off at a distance. Maybe he was off naming some of the creatures or exploring things. She gave to her husband who was with her. Right there. He's standing there, and here comes the serpent. And they're not like, <gasps> I mean, when I see a snake, I'm like freaked out. I don't care if it's a garter snake or what it is. I mean, it has the same effect upon me as <gasps> reproach. But here, it's, it's talking. Now, obviously, you know, after God pronounces the curse upon the serpent that, you know, he's going to crawl around on his belly and he's going to, you know, lap up the dust and the dirt and he's going to breathe all this dust all the days of his life. Before that, maybe he was a quadruped. Who knows? You know, we don't really have an understanding of what he was before the fall. So he entices the woman to think that she can be just like God. God is withholding something from you is what he was saying. God has not been fully forthcoming to you. This is implication. Ooh, these are all lies. God was trying to protect them, and they willingly disobeyed him. Now, we read that Adam was not deceived. Eve was. When we realize Eve was created from Adam, God put Adam to sleep, took one of his ribs, made Eve. Okay? We understand, we realize this, and I'm sorry, the rib count defuncts, debunks evolution. I mean, there's a distinction. I won't even go down that path. But needless to say, God was withholding from them an understanding, the knowledge of good and evil, and that is true. He was withholding that from them as protection. Now they have come to know good and evil. And what is the outcome of this? What does Adam do? Boy, Eve, you've sure done it now. I'm glad I'm not you. I'm going to go away while God deals with you. He could have left her to suffer. Well, essentially, it was what would be epitomized as God's wrath. Obviously, he did not, wages of sin is death. He did not kill them. But he told them, if you do this, you will die. And what was the serpent said? Oh, you surely will not die. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. That was the woman's words. 
but they didn't die. Guess what? They were spiritually alive. When they died, they died spiritually and realized they were naked. What a, we're flesh. What, what happened? They transcended or descended <laughs> in their transition to being men and women. Now, Adam could have chose many different things, but being, now, just hear me out. As a type of Christ, what did he do? He chose to suffer the same fate as his bride. He made the choice. He made the choice to eat of the fruit to be with her. Now you think about it. What did Christ do for his bride? He became sin. Adam became sinful. Christ became sin. Well, can you even fathom what? I can't even fathom what that means. The holy, spotless God, creator of all things, became sin. He in the garden, garden crying, Father, if thou be willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but thine be done. What was in the cup? We read of the bitter dregs. A dreg is the lowest and the bitterest part of something. So in the wine, when it is bottled, depending on how it's filtered. Now we're talking about, you know, biblical times. When it's bottled, the the garbage goes to the bottom. The worst, ooh, just the foul. The foulness goes to the bottom. Christ drank the cup of bitter dregs. Turned it over. Nothing came out. He did. He drank the evil of the world. And we read in Revelation that they will drink it and stammer because of it. They will drink the full cup of God's wrath, those that receive the mark of the beast. So Christ in the garden, sweating drops of blood, uh, that's a true medical condition. Was it fear of the Romans? The scourging? Being nailed to the cross? So we see his fear in the garden. You know, many misrepresent, misunderstand what Christ was really doing, what he was really emotionally going through, because he is both God and man. And he, he knew. He, he knows everything. He knew what would befall him, how he would be betrayed by one, which he controlled the situation. Judas Iscariot, go and do what you're going to do, is what he says. And at that moment, Judas got up and left. Christ controlled the situation. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew who was going to betray him. He said, go, go ahead and do it. Peter says, Lord, I'm ready to die for you. Oh, really, Peter? <laughs> for the Cock crows, you're going to deny me three times that you even know me. Well, I'd never do that, essentially, is what Peter's trying to say, but it's exactly what he does. So we see he's arrested, goes before Annas and Caiaphas, and they send him to Herod, and goes before Pontius Pilate. He's judged. You see, he goes before all these. Now, if you go back to the Passover, they were to take a, a lamb without blemish, bring it into their home, 
They would have it there for seven days. They would examine it. They would examine it to try to find fault. Christ went before them and was examined. And Pilate gives the record of that. I find no fault in him. And what's man want to do? Take him and have him flogged. And the crowd that just a few days later said, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And they lay down the palm leaves. Now they're saying, crucify him. Crucify him. <laughs> Amazing how people at one moment think one thing and at another moment they think something else. Maybe the crowd had something to do with that. So they beat him. They scourge him within an inch of his life, force him to carry this cross to outside of the city. You know, just like the scapegoat. Just like the lamb that is killed outside of the city for the sins of the many. This is exactly what Christ would do. The fulfillment of all the sacrifices. The fulfillment of all the law. All of that came down to him. Read Psalm 22. You'll see exactly what he went through. David witnessed it. Without ever even seeing it physically, he witnessed it and wrote of it. So what of that atoned for sin? Going back to the garden? Sweating the drops of blood? Did that make atonement for sin? No. Appearing before the council of the leaders of the temple. Then pulling his beard out, putting a bag over his head, beating him, telling him, who did it? Tell us who did it. Did that make atonement for sin? No. The scourging. Them giving him all those lashes with the cat of nine tails, tearing his flesh open, having a competition between those that would be beating him to see who could inflict the most damage. Did that make atonement for sin? No. Having him carry this cross, bearing his burden, going to the top of that hill, being nailed to it, set upright, did that make atonement for sin? No. No, none of this did. This is just what man wants to do to God. It's what man wants to do to God. He wants to kill God. Well, God's righteous. We're not. Let's kill him. Crucify him. Crucify him. I find no fault in him. Crucify him anyway. When the imputation of the sins of the world came upon Christ, and he was killed upon that cross by his Father, that's when atonement for sin was made. He was forsaken. Only one time did he not call him Father? It was upon that cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what he feared. Having his Father turn his back upon him. So much so that the sky grew dark for three hours. The Jews counted that as two days. A sunrise and a sunset. That's why we always get messed up trying to count him being in the grave for three days because they counted that as two. They put him on the cross from noon till three, I think was the time frame. The sky grew dark. Hey, that's night. The sky brightens up again. That's another day. It looked like he was on the cross for two days. And then the Romans, they come to break the legs, you know, to get them out of their misery. He was already dead. Joseph of Arimathea goes to claim the body and begs of it from Pilate. You mean he's already dead? Why? God killed him upon that cross for your sins, for my sins. 
He was betrayed by us. Now some would say, oh, that doesn't matter. That's just a story. Is it? Is it? I could go in a restaurant and I could say, Mickey Mouse is real. He's true. He's alive. I saw him the other day. And you know, people would say, that's just the cutest thing. They believe that Mickey Mouse is alive, that he's a real person or a real mouse like a person. But when I say Jesus Christ is alive, people, what do they want to do? They get angry. They get upset. Why is Christ, Jesus Christ, such a cuss word? Why do they use his name for Christ's sake? The things that they say, forgive me, Lord. Why do they do that? Why do they blaspheme the name of God, GD this or whatever? Why do they do that? Why don't they say, oh, Mickey Mouse? <laughs> you see, it's spiritual warfare, folks. I could get deep into spiritual warfare, the unseen realm, and it's alive and doing well. God allows it. Don't know why, but you know, life is but a thimble full of time. A thimble full of time. What will you do in this life? You know, I work, you see, these machines around me, always trying to invent the greater mousetrap so I can make money without having to kill myself. It's a fleeting. This stuff, it's just stuff. It's a fleeting. Do you need it in this life? Yeah, but does it control you? That's the question. This life is a fleeting. It is a measure of eternity. What will you do in this life? You think you're going to earn eternal life through doing good? No, you're not. Ephesians clearly tells us it is a gift of God. Grace and faith both come from God. You're not going to do anything to, to work off your bad. You know, that's what popular religion says. Do good. Just do good. You'll erase all that bad. That is the biggest load of garbage there ever was. That's what all religions say. But the gospel says you cannot. He did. Christ himself paid your debt of sin. That's exactly what he did upon that cross. He was killed dying the death that you and I deserve. That's the gospel. And for those that put their faith in them, for God has given every unto every man a measure of faith. Pistuo, the ability to believe. And if you believe in all your heart and confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God says you can be saved. Now, we're not to tell anybody they're saved. We're to tell them they can be. How do you do that? Well, let's say that you're and you're on the side of a, a cliff. It's a sheer drop. And you've gone up and down through there a thousand times. It's, it's close to the edge. But this time it had rained like a week before. It finally dried out, but it loosened the ground. So you get up to the top and you start slipping. And oh no, you're going off of this cliff and there's a root hanging out. And you, you grab a hold of that root. And it's holding you. But there's nothing else. It's a sheer drop. This is your only means of being saved. Is what you're holding on to. What you're doing to hold yourself there. Maybe you've got your claws in a little ledge or something. And you're holding on. This is your life. This is what you're holding on to. Now let's suppose a helicopter comes down. You're screaming, help, help, help. A helicopter comes down. And it's a super strong man holding onto the helicopter, reaching out his arm to save you. But you've got to let go. That is repentance. You have to let go of what you think is going to save you and grab onto something that's surely going to save you. That being Christ. Your life is wrapped up in this root that's being pulled out. And until you repent, which means to turn away from what you think is going to save you and turn to something that's truly going to save you, and it's a person, 
Jesus Christ. That's the only way that you can be saved. And here's the clincher. I can't command you to do this. I can't tell you to raise your hand so I can pray for you. God has to convict you of sin. That's what tells us in John chapter 16 and verse 8. And when he comes, the Holy Spirit will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, if you're being convicted, reproved of sin, and you realize you're a sinner, and the only way out for you ain't to do good, because it's not in you, there is but one good, God and God alone. And what it means to be good is ascribing to the moral order of the universe. Can you do that? No, you cannot. You must be saved from your own sins by the one that is sinless, the one that already has paid that debt, for the wages of sin is death. If you will repent, turn away from what you think is going to save you to the true Savior, do it and find out what happens. It's not hard. You have to let go, which is the hardest thing. This is the only thing holding me. If I let go, I'm going to surely fall. And you're right. But until you let go, you cannot be saved. It's like a swimmer. You know, you hear stories of this, you know, this man that's drowning, beating at the water, and the people on the shore, help, help, he's drowning, and the lifeguard comes out. And he's standing there, and he's watching the guy still beating. He's still trying to hold himself up. And the people are going crazy. Jump in and help him. Jump in and help him. And the lifeguard stands there and watches, and finally the guy goes, mm. he jumps in and saves him. And the people are like, why didn't you save him sooner? Well, if I would have jumped in there and tried to save him, he would have probably knocked me out. He would have fought against what I'm trying to do, and I wouldn't have been able to save him. You cannot save somebody who thinks they can save themselves. That's it. How can a man be saved? By God's grace. In repentance, there's room for salvation. Because there is room for repentance to those who realize they're wrong. Period. You realize you're wrong? Realize you've been wrong? Realize you've made wrong choices? You have lied? You've stolen? You've looked lustfully at a man or a woman? Well, those are sins. Everybody does it, sure. But you're going to be judged individually. Hey, if there's a Nine people in a car and they're all high on drugs and the police pull them over. Who all do you think they're going to arrest? You've all got possession of narcotics. You know, you're all high as a kite. He pulls, who's going to jail? Well, he was driving. <laughs> you're all going to jail. We are all convicted. You know, innocent until proven guilty. We are guilty until made innocent. By the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, whether you love him, whether you hate him, whether you despise him, whether you would fall on the ground and worship his feet, he is the Lord of all. So to the conclusion of this message, we have 1 Corinthians 15, Apostle Paul speaking. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Is past tense, which also you received wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain, unless you believe for no reason. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, which that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. If he's not raised to life, it's pointless. We're all going to die then. You're all going to die anyway, but there's no hope. If he's not raised, you have no hope. He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. Well, there's a witness account here. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. Most of them are still alive, the apostles saying, go ask them if you don't believe me. But some are falling asleep, asleep. They're asleep. Death is as sleep. That's the only way we can comprehend it. Your dreams. 
Do they make any sense to you while you're awake? You talk about a dream you had, but does not it make perfect sense to you while you're asleep? Best way we can describe it. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. But last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I'm the least of the apostles, then am not meek to be called an apostle, because I persecute the church of God, God's ecclesia. He was a Christian terrorist. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. It's only by the grace of God he is what he is now, is what he's saying. It's only by God's grace I'm doing what I'm doing now. Not me, it's his grace which was bestowed upon me, it was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. See, he can't take credit for it. It's the grace of God causing this to abound. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so ye believed, you know, if there's no one to preach, how can someone believe? How can you just, all those who shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? You know, that Romans 10, 13, for so many preachers, that that's, that's the only scripture they need. But it says further, how can they believe if there's not a preacher? How can they preach if they're not sent? How beautiful are the feet of those that are sent to give this gospel. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. If it is for a fact there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ was just, he just died. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith also is vain. Yea, we are found false witnesses of God, because we testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so, be that the red dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. His dying, his perfect you know, he was risen because he was perfect and spotless. The grave could not hold him. So certainly part of the gospel message has to be that he and only he, many men went to that cross. You know, they there was two thieves that, you know, truly were thieves that were one nailed to each side of him. Their death accomplished nothing. They just died, except for the one. The Lord said, today you will be with me in paradise the lord knew he had faith the other one railed on him for if the dead rise not then is not christ raised christ is not raised your faith is vain you're yet in your sins they which also are fallen asleep in christ they're just dead they're perished if in this life only we have hope in christ and that be the case that he is not raised from the dead we of all men are most miserable but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept? And it's not a question, that's a statement. He is. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after they that are Christ's at his coming. He's the first, and the others are coming after him. Well. He's the preeminence. He's preeminent in all things. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. In Matthew 28, he says, All authority on heaven and earth, is, all power and authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. I have to look that up. I'm paraphrasing, but that's the gist of it. For he must reign till he put all his enemies under his feet, or put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. 
For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he, hath, when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted. Now I'm not sure what the E-X-C-E-P-T-E-D. Accepted. Which did put all things under him. I would have to look up what that means in the King James. Accepted. I don't understand that word. I understand A-C-C-E-P-T. Accept. Uh, exception. E-X-C-E-P-T-I-O-N. That's what we're looking at here. doesn't matter. And when all things shall be subdued unto him. I think that's. That's what we're, we're saying here. Them being subdued unto him. Then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? Do you baptize or do you bury someone to make them dead? Or do you bury them because they are dead? See, a lot of people have a misconception about baptism. So baptism, essentially, is saying, I am dying to myself. I agree to take up my cross and follow Christ. I agree to die to myself, to be raised, to walk in a new life with Jesus Christ as his disciple. That's what baptism is signifying. It's the first act of obedience and discipleship. Matthew 28, go into all the worlds and make disciples pupils. So those that would have a disciple under them would be not necessarily a teacher because Christ says call no one teacher. They would be taught of Christ. So when we look to the scriptures and give it to others, we are teaching to disciples Christ's word. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are then they baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? It's just like what I was talking about, about Mickey Mouse. Who wants to kill you for believing in Mickey Mouse? But they want to kill you for believing in Christ. You see the paradox here, right? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at, Eph uh, at Ephesus, what advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. You know, it was reported of some of those that would be the Christians that would be made, you know, a uh, spectacle of and made sport of. They put them in, you know, these uh, amphitheaters and the Colosseum, and they would send out the wild beasts on them, and some of them would say, if the lion doesn't attack me, I'll attack the lion. Well, what advantage would it be for you if the dead are not raised to life that are believers in Christ? Wouldn't you want to preserve your body and live as long as you could, save it from harm? Why would they do that? Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So there was some that were in there that they were agnostic, without knowledge. Morons. That's what it means. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2 in the context of the original language, Greek, it specifically calls me a moron. I got called a moron about eight times in the first two chapters. God has called the moronish to confound the wise. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? Now what, what does their body look like? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. That which thou sowest, thou sowest not that the body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or some. What's he saying here? 
If you sow a seed, it's going to come up as it's type. You plant daisies, they're going to come up daisies. You plant cucumbers, they're going to come up cucumbers. Beans, beans, tomatoes, tomatoes. That's what he's talking about. All flesh is not the same flesh. There is one kind of flesh of men, another of the birds, beasts, and other fishes. There are also celestial bodies, bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one. The glory terrestrial, that's another. There is one glory of the sun, one of the moon. The glory of the stars, one star differs from another in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. That's the greatest mystery of all. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, raised in power. It is sown in natural bodies, raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Live, quickening. To quicken means to be alive. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. Natural Adam, spiritual Christ. Do you understand? For the first man is of the earth earthly, the second man is the Lord from heaven. As we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. We will be like him. We'll be able to walk through it. Remember, he would come to the disciples and whoop, he would just appear. Got anything to eat? And whoop, he'd be gone. We'll be able to do that. That's amazing. Now, this I say, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You've got to be born of the Spirit. John chapter 3, Nicodemus. That which is flesh is flesh, that which is spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born anything from above by God. Or, as King James says, again. It's not really what it means, again. It means from the first, from above, by God. You must be born of God. This ain't something you can do for yourself. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So, have I got anything stainless steel laying here? You know, you think stainless steel is truly st stainless throughout. Well, it'll ultimately corrode, but if we compare rusty metal to the corruptible and the incorruptibility of titanium, I don't think titanium, uh, I don't think it tarnishes or ox or gets an oxide layer on Maybe it does. I don't know. Um, but we would be like the purest of the pure, you know, like the refining of, of the gold, the pureness. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. That last enemy shall be defeated at that point. O death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. The thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, like a statue, Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You're not wasting your time. This, I mean, I've got other things I could be doing that would actually put money in my pocket, but this may be getting somehow someone convicted that they repent, take up the Lord, and this becomes eternal life for them. That's not in vain, you see. These things are not in vain. So, 
without Christ, we're nothing. We're hopeless. Without his resurrection, many could die, could say they could die for sins, could pretend to be righteous, but God raised him up. We must be raised to walk in anew by God. God must convict of sin so that we will repent and believe. We would accept his grace, his unmerited, undeserved favor. It's undeserved. And we don't deserve it. If you think you deserved it, you cannot be saved. If you think, oh, God looked down the line and saw something in me. If you think that, you ain't saved. Because he didn't see nothing in you. He sees his son. We're an after product of all this. It's the relationship between the father and the son. And the wrath of God abides upon the sinner. Christ died in the place of the sinner. Died the death that you deserve. The only way you can be saved is through his propitiation. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Let us pray, dear Heavenly Father, Lord. I pray that you bless this message, you convict of sin, and there would be those out there that would repent and believe. Lord, I thank you for your grace and your mercy, for without it, Lord, I would be nothing more than a foul, wretched sinner in the gutter somewhere doing something I shouldn't be doing. But Lord... I thank you for your grace that you've given us. And I pray for those that would come to uh, saving knowledge of who you truly are. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.